Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody back from lunch. I hope you ate well and you're ready for an informative afternoon. My name is Barry Sanders. Uh, I'm a, also a quantum physicist. I'm from the University of Calgary. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the afternoon. That's um, uh, John Martinez, who's a professor here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's been here since 2004. Um, he was an undergraduate and a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley and his PhD thesis was seminal in this field. So what he's talking about, he did the work that actually opened up um, all these wonderful possibilities. Uh, after he was at Berkeley, he went to Paris-Saclay, where he was a postdoc, and then he was at uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder for 15 years, and came here in 2004. Without further ado, I'd like to have John take over. Thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure uh, to talk to you today. Um, you know, one of the real um, exciting moments when you're learning physics is when you finally get to take quantum mechanics and learn, you know, in the details of how really nature works. And it's very interesting because you're putting together things you learned about particles, things you learned about waves in a really interesting, at first non-intuitive way, but up over time you begin to understand the rules and figure out what's going on. And um, what's been really fun for me is the experiments I've done in my career to try to take those rules of quantum mechanics and apply it to macroscopic systems, not just atoms, but in this case, a group of atoms formed by an integrated circuit, maybe millimeters across, and the currents and voltages in these wires are not just a classical variable like in a normal Indian pro uh, Intel processor or something, but they're actually quantum mechanical variables. And to understand the behavior of this chip, you have to invoke quantum mechanics uh, to do so. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, field to try to understand how you do that. Um, I'm going to talk about that, but I'm going to talk about the first half or so of my talk, really trying to review the quantum uh, phenomena I know with teachers here. I want to first kind of take some of the knowledge that we've learned on these really nice modern experiments on quantum physics and maybe explain kind of conventional physics that you might see in an introductory physics class and how we can use those concepts, hopefully to better explain what's going on for your students. Uh, and the second reason I want to do this is a kind of personal. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I had a very difficult moment in the chemistry class um, when we were first introducing quantum physics, it turns out. And um, what happened that day is they were talking about how the periodic table came about and the shell model and all this. And they had this way to, you know, questions that we had to answer. And, you know, usually I was really great in the science class, no surprise. However, that day I had no idea how to do any of the problems. It was totally, you know, completely blanked my mind. And I would talk to other students and try to figure it out. And eventually it dawned on me after about 20 minutes that we were just supposed to memorize a set of rules and then apply them to figure out how atoms got put together. Okay, and of course, you know, being a physicist, that, that didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> which tells you why I'm doing right now, and hopefully you understand that. Uh, and I want to, hopefully if I'm successful here, we'll go beyond those rules, talk a little bit how the rules could come about, and you know, maybe I'm hoping that will be useful for your students. If you have a few students who are good for physics, uh, please note that. Uh, and then um, we'll talk about quantum circuits at the end, OK? I first want to talk about quantum light and photons. And talking about photons is really kind of hard because you've heard photons so much from when you've been watching episodes of Star Trek, right? They use photons all the time. And these Hollywood script writers, basically, whenever they see the word light, they, separate, they put in the word photon because it sounds really cool and futuristic and blah, blah, blah. So you get all these crazy ideas like the photon torpedo, which would, re, which would have an energy of about 10 to the minus 19 joules and would never do anything. <laughs> what are they talking about? Okay. 
so what we have to, I want to reintroduce the idea of, of photons. And of course, it's just that when you measure the energy of light, it comes in packets of HF times, uh, times N. And I want to talk about this. Now, when you study this in introductory cl uh, classes, you studied black body radiation, OK? So they noticed in the, around 1900 or so, you heat something up, it gives off infrared radiation or light if it's hot enough. You look at the power coming out at different frequencies. There's this kind of spectrum. And if you use classical physics, you cannot understand that spectrum. And what Planck did is said that the energy came in quanta like this. And when you make that assumption, you then understand it. This is really hard to teach, really hard to understand. You know, you're not going to be doing that in high school. What I want to show you is with modern physics, you can teach this concept in high school. It's kind of cool. So this is the idea. We're going to talk about measuring the energy of a photon pulse with a thermometer. So what I have here is I have a laser and then a beam. And what I'm going to do with the laser is I'm going to tar target it at the, some thermometer. And then I'm going to cut the beam with my hand and then turn it on for a second and cut it again. So this is going in and out for a T on. The energy coming into this is power times T on. And if you look at the thermometer response, it's going to be flat, say at room temperature. And then it's going to heat up when you give it this energy. And the temperature rise is going to be E over C. And then it's going to drop back to the base temperature, do the whatever thermal conductivity it has to the room temperature. Okay? And basically, by looking at the temperature rise, you can calibrate out what the energy of this pulse was. OK, very simple. OK, now what happens with quantum mechanics is you take this and you just attenuate this light more and more. So you might start out with a milliwatt beam and a fraction of a second, and you attenuate by many, many orders of magnitude down to the energy to 10 to the minus 19 joules. OK. And you would expect classically that, OK, even though you're attenuating it, you're still going to get some temperature profile like this. Now, in modern experiments, you can actually measure these tiny little energy differences. And this is an experiment I was involved in the inception at NIST, now carried by Sei Nam. What they have is they have a little strip of superconducting metal right at its transition temperature with two wires going in here. And then they have light from a fiber off as it's coming down and shines on that. It gets absorbed by the metal and heats it up. OK? And when it heats it up, the resistance between here and here changes. It's a thermometer. And then you measure it with this very sensitive superconducting device here. And what you're going to get is, is a little t pulse temperature that's very, very sensitive. It's at 0.1 Kelvin, super low temperatures, super low heat capacity. So you have a lot of sensitivity. And what happens is when you measure this, you get pulses like you get here. But now this is about a, a few hundred pulses. Now instead of seeing one pulse here, you see bands of pulses. Sometimes you see nothing. Sometimes you see this band, this band, this band, this band. But it, it goes up and down like this. But you see that there's banding here. OK? What's going on here? What I'm going to do is I'm going to histogram these pulse heights and plot them. And if you histogram those pulse heights, you see that there's a bunch of these that are of 0, a bunch of them that has this height here, which we call 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And what this histogram represents is even though you're putting down this pulse, which you think has some average energy, when you actually measure it, measure it on a very small energy scale, you're seeing sometimes 0 photons coming through or one, or two, or three, or four, or five, up to seven or more. Okay, So this is directly showing that the photon energy is coming in quantized units of HF. Okay, And you don't have to do all the statistical mechanics. You directly see that quantization coming through here. And that just shows that the energy of light comes in quanta, according to this formula. Direct observation through here. OK? So this, to me, is really neat. I think you can explain this. When my students in undergraduate quantum mechanics saw this, they like, wow, well, what's going on there? But it's conventional physics. Of course, it's non-classical. It's quantum. OK, let's go on now to atoms. 
And um, I just want to ask to start with a very simple question. Why do atoms have size? And if they didn't have the size they had, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. So this is kind of an important question. And the answer, of course, is quantum mechanics. So where does this come from? Take a nucleus, a pro this is very small size. Electrons fundamentally are point particles. We know they're going to attract. And if they have no size and they're going to attract, well, why, why aren't the, the size of atoms super small? What's going on there? Now, you might say, well, how do we know they aren't orbiting around like the planet around the sun? Yeah, they can do that. But when they orbit around, they're shaking back and forth, and these electrons are going to emit light. And you know that's true. You take, for example, a light bulb. You heat up the filament really hot. The electrons are shaken back and forth. They're giving off white light. And it turns out when you calculate this, the energy loss from the light it's going to spiral down to the nucleus very fast. So we know from the existence of size of atoms that these are not going to be point light objects. Okay? So, so it, it has to be some other. And of course, the answer is quantum mechanics. As I told my young kids about this, I said, well, that's because electrons are fuzzy. Okay? They have some spatial extent. So that's the first model you have of it. But that actually isn't quite the right model. For example, if you have these fuzzy electrons orbiting this in some way, they're coming in here, they're orbiting, they're going to spiral down in some way as they emit the light. You would expect that as they spiral down, they would give a white light spectrum, just like with the filament of a, of a light. As I talked about, they're accelerating around in you know, white here, and they're spiraling in tighter and tighter. You would expect it. But that's not what atoms do. You go and experimentally measure them, you get distinct colors coming out of here. For example, when you look at neon signs, they have a very distinct color coming out of it having to do with these exact kind of physics I'm talking about here uh, with various gases. Uh, you look at the color of, of, of coming from molecules from dyes. You look at light emitting dials. You know that all these atom systems are giving very uh, discrete uh, uh, light coming out of here. Well, of course, the picture for that is this Bohr picture, where we have distinct orbits of electrons going around here. And somehow, when these electrons make a transition from here to here, there's energy here, different energy here. That gives that out in discrete uh, photon energy and just describes that. And this has some modest applicability, as you well know. But it really does not picture what's going on precisely at all. Uh, in, a, in a real system. So we need a better picture. And of course, the better picture is that electrons are actually waves. They're particles. In many circumstances, they can be waves. And specifically, in an atom, they're standing waves. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about standing waves to review how that's going to explain what's going on in the atom. So this is probably a simple experiment uh, you've done in your class. You take a rope and you vibrate it up and down. And there are certain resonance frequencies where you get a lot of amplitude with a little bit of shaking. Here's the fundamental, okay, which we're going to write here as a unit of frequency. And if it sh shake it twice as fast, you start getting this mode here. And you shake it three times as fast, and you get these modes here. So it's just standing waves uh, uh, between these two kind of fixed points right here. And I'm going to argue that you know electrons, electrons, they, they form standing waves in the same way. But this is a one-dimensional case. Let's do something a little bit more complicated. And we have a drum. OK, it's just a two-dimensional version of this. The outside of the drum is fixed. And then the drum head is oscillating up and down. The lowest energy frequency here is where the whole center of the drum head is going up and down. It kind of looks like this state. And I'm going to call it 1s. So the s will be for symmetric right now. At a slightly higher frequency, uh, you have uh, a, another state at, right here. And you see in this state, this is going down and this is going up in this direction. It kind of looks like this. But in this direction here, it's kind of looking like this, where it's just going up and down or going down and up. So it's a combination of these two. And for this case, I'm going to call that a px and py, because this, this one is going in the x direction. But besides just there being an x coordinate, there's also a y coordinate. So you can also have this kind of mode going in the y direction. So there's two modes here. So I'll say px, py. And then you go a little bit higher frequency. We now have another symmetric mode 
where this is going down, up, down, up, kind of looks like this. And then you have this, this kind of mode combining with that, which I'm going to call the 3PX, PY, and 3S, et cetera. Okay, so you have these different modes, and you have these different degeneracies in here. This is degenerate in two modes because you have an X and a Y direction to the drum head. Okay, so now let's go back to our quantum mechanics. And it's different. Quantum mechanics is not a string or a drum head, but it, in the end, it's a wave equation, and they're standing waves. And the electron attracted to the, the proton forms some kind of box. Okay, it's a little bit uh, smooth kind of box, but it kind of forms a box that can form standing waves in the same way that this. And now the way to predict those standing waves is hard. You have to solve the Schrodinger equation. But qualitatively, the results are very similar to what you've seen here. You have a lowest energy or lowest frequency or energy uh, state right here, which is a symmetric case, kind of like this. And here's a two-dimensional slice where the color is just the intensity here. And then at a higher frequency, you have 2s and 2p states. This 2p state uh, kind of looks like this, where it's uh, high and it has a minimum, and then high and goes to zero. And then here, it kind of looks like this state, where you have this way it's not, it's not oscillating, and this way it's oscillating. And here, it's sort of like 2s. In the analogy here, you have a 2s, 2px, 2py. Now, because it's three dimensions, not two dimensions, you have a third degeneracy and then a third state over here. And you can go up and it's a higher here. There's a 3s, 3p state, kind of has the symmetry here, but there's an added zero. And then there are some more complicated angular modes here, which we call the, the 3d states. And there's five modes there, and 4s, et cetera, OK? So these are the, uh, uh, we call the eigenfrequencies that we solve for the hydrogen atom. It's very much like these, okay? It's a different physics, but in the end, it's just electron standing waves, okay? So with that concept, you now can understand what goes on with uh, photons uh, uh, being emitted like this. It's, let's say the electron's far away from the hydrogen atom. It starts to effectively spiral in. But what it's going to do is it's going to make a series of transitions between these standing waves. And for example, the transition between here and here is going to give you an ultraviolet photon, which you can measure and see that. But you see that if you're making transitions between these standing waves, you now get discrete frequencies in your spectrum. So these kind of eigenstates explain the discrete spectrum. Here it is for hydrogen, here it is for helium. It's more complicated. Other uh, atoms have even more complicated spectra, very rich spectra. One can understand that. But the, the basic idea comes from these electron standing waves. The fact that each atom has its own standing wave pattern transition is very nice. For example, you want to make, want to understand what is the sun made out of? OK, you can't go there and take a sample but you can look at the light coming from it. You basically have a broad continuum of a light because this is a plasma. The electrons, are, most of them are stripped off. They're oscillating at high temperature, getting off white light. But you see absorption lines from the fact that there are some atoms which are combined. That white light going through those atoms gives you absorption. And here you see a line from hydrogen. You see another line here. And then these other lines will tell you what are the other elements that are, that are coming in there, too. So by studying this in the sun, you can know its composition. And then, of course, you can study that from stars far away and see if they're composed the same way. And then if you have uh, uh, shifts due to relative velocities, you can study that, too. So this unique spectrum from the atoms are very useful uh, in the whole wide range of science to identify what's going on. I now want to talk about how the periodic table is put together here. You're seeing the joke. That's good. Uh, this goes back to my little problem in high school. And I need to talk about the Pauli exclusion principles. So the basic idea here is the electrons come in two states, spin up, where this point particle is somehow spinning around on its axis. And it can either spin in the positive direction or in the negative direction, OK? And don't tell me how, don't ask how a point particle spins. It just does, it's, it's property. And it has these two states. 
And then the Pauli extrusion principle says it's not possible for two electrons to be in the same state. So what does this mean? So I'm going to give an example. You have an identical twin, completely identical. And you can be in the, a room, or your twin can be in a room. But as soon as you try to be in the room together, it's like there's this magical force that prevents you from getting into the room. And actually, more accurate is if you actually were to step in the room, you would both cease to exist. That's more accurate of what's going on. <laughs> so, you know, it's strange. Okay, I understand. It's just, you know, how do you understand that? That's really strange. You just can't do it. However, if you were to have your twin uh, stand upside down in the room and then walk in together, everything would be okay. Okay, that's really strange. Okay, but that's what the Pauli extrusion principle says, and except for people, it's for electrons, and we're going to talk about spin up and spin down. Up, up, that hasn't had happen. Up, down, up, that can happen. Okay, so that's just some weird thing of physics. Now, that is a really important and strange uh, physics phenomenon. And it turns out in physics, we can understand that due to something called a spin statistics theorem, which is something that is even, you know, typically beyond graduate level quantum mechanics. This is something for very smart theorists like Lars to understand. Me, I, that's, that's really, really tough to do that. However, when I was trying to understand this for experiment I'll talk about later, I went up and talked to the particle physicists and said, okay, do you guys have a simple explanation? And they then pointed me to an article by Richard Feynman, who has a very good reputation of explaining things that are really complicated, but in a kind of a simple way, okay, that you can understand it. So he said, oh, there's a paper by him. And I went ahead and I read this paper, and it was like really complicated, okay, and it's just... <laughs> That's, okay. And what was great is at the end of the article, he said, you know, I'm sorry. I tried to make this as simple as possible. I know it's too complicated. And he kind of understood that. But he also said, look, when I gave this talk, there was this guy who, who talked to me afterwards, and he kind of has this simpler explanation, which I'm going to give in the appendix. And that's kind of what I want to talk here about, is this simple, really kind of neat, neat explanation here. So the way it goes is all electrons are identical. So if you exchange those electrons, they're the same thing. You can't tell them apart. You should get the same physics. Okay? So what he's going to do is then you say, okay, if you exchange two electrons, this one goes to this one here, it has this strange idea that that is equivalent to one electron rotating by 360 degrees. Now that's kind of a weird thing to see just by saying it, so I have to do my physics demonstration. So I'm going to take two electrons here, and I'm going to exchange them, okay? Now, do you see what happens when I exchange them? There's a twist, and I'm going to remove that twist by rotating this 180 degrees, and now 360 degrees, and the twist is gone. Now I'm going back to the same thing, okay? So I hope, you know, I don't know how to prove that mathematically, but <laughs> theorists can do that. But I just did it here. That's fine. Okay. And then finally, this is the interesting part. When you rotate something by 360 degrees, you take something that's called a boson, for example, a photon, which has spin 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, an integer spin. When you rotate that, that goes as e to the i, 2 pi, 0, 1, 2, 3, that's, that's just uh, 1. So the state goes to itself. And then nothing happens. You know, same state as you expect. But you take something that's this weird two-level state, which is electron, which is a fermion, that has a half a spin, and you do e to the 2 pi 1 half, that's e to the i pi. That's a minus sign. Okay? That says that the state x, the electron state, goes from x to minus x. So this, this connects the spin, whether it's integer or half integer, to the statistics. Okay? So now let's solve the problem. For the electron, you do this, and you have a solution of x is equal to minus x. Well, what's the solution? I, this is a little homework problem. Okay, what is it? Zero, yes, yes. Zero means the amplitude of this state is zero. The probability is amplitude squared. Probability zero, you can't have that state, okay? 
So um, that shows that with this weird spin statistics here that you can't put two electrons in the, in the same state. Now, when I read that article, I then went up and talked to the, the physicists again. And they say, well, you know, you know, I told them how great this was. And they said, you know, that, that thing at the end isn't really that great. Okay, and, and you know, you do the theory properly, and that really okay, may motivate the answer, but deep down, okay, you have to do it in a more complicated way. And I kind of think that, you know, what they really want you to do is take five years of theory classes to understand it. Okay. But for me, the way I look at it is if you can explain this very nice idea of the spin statistics theorem using a piece of toilet paper, Okay, then you have to, you know, you have to do that. So, so, so uh, be aware. This is this is motivating. Maybe uh, you have to think about it more carefully. Okay, so let's build a periodic table. And what I'm going to say is the electrons uh, are going to mostly fill according to this hydrogen atom energy levels. They're going to interact a little bit and mess things around a little bit. Most, more or less, that's going to be correct. So, if you want a hydrogen atom. Uh, you have a single proton, single charge, you have a single electron, that just comes in here, goes to the bottom state, fills up there. And then you take uh, two protons in the center for a helium atom, and uh, you'll have an electron, it'll come in here, and it'll fill that state here, but it has to go into opposite spin states, okay? Now you go ahead, and, and of course you note that in this case, these excited states where you might have some chemical bonding due to is way up here high in energy, so this is not going to want to interact much with all. It's, a, it's an inert uh, noble gas. With lithium, that electron is, can't go in there, so it fills up in the 2s. The 2s is slightly lower energy than this because of the way the, these electrons interact. Uh, but okay, you get the 2s, you fill up the next electron downstate here. You then start putting more electrons here, and it starts filling into these, these p states because that's the lowest energy. And then it starts uh, filling in these ways, and that gives you this column of the, the p orbitals. You do the same thing again with the s orbitals, and then the same thing with, again with the three p orbitals, and you get this, these rows of the periodic table. And of course, this explains why like oxygen and sulfur are going to have uh, similar um, chemical uh, results because these p orbitals are uh, kind of being filled in the same way so that the chemistry, the outermost electrons are like, kind of looking in the same way. So the chemistry is not identical, but it's very similar. And the next surprise comes here. You would say, hey, aren't you going to fill these states here? But instead you fill these states, the electrons are interacting and that effectively pushes these energies up so that these interact. But then at the next uh, filling, you, you fill these, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So basically, this very simple idea of the electrons um, having these kind of states, standing wave states, and filling according to the Pauli principle explains the basic structure of the periodic table. And you can see how elements and similar columns are going to have similar chemistry. And of course, the chemists uh, have looked at this in way more detail and explained this uh, much better uh, in, in that detail using more advanced concepts. But I think you can get the basic idea. I just want to kind of conclude this section with the simple idea, why is the natural world so rich and structural? First of all, can, quantum mechanics give atom size. If we didn't have size, we'd not be here to talk about. But more interesting is the way that it, it happens you have a wide variety of chemical bonds, okay? Now this might be a little bit surprising to you if you think about this. The basic force between the nucleus and the electron is a radial one over R squared. And yet when you form chemical bonds, you have these interesting bond angles and structures that form in complex molecules, which are of course very essential to life and molecular biology and very important the way everything gets built together. And where did the directionality come from? Well, it comes from the exclusion principle, which is forces populations, not just in the symmetric cells, but in these P and D orbitals and all these complex orbitals. And if you look back up here, they have some directionality. Their electrons are in this direction, in this direction, but not in this direction, and here it's even more complicated. So these very complex P and D orbitals gives you all this interesting directionality uh, information that uh, forms the basis 
of, uh, of chemistry and, and structural uh, things. Now, just one interesting thing, this is like what physicists like to think about. What would chemistry be like without the exclusion principle? Say that it had, if electron had spin zero, it was a boson, so it would go from you know, plus to plus, and let's say that because of that, you would then be filling all the lowest energy levels in the hydrogen atom, okay? All the elements would be hydrogen-like and symmetric, and your periodic table would just be the hydrogen column, okay? These would all be spherically symmetric wave functions, and things would kind of stick together in some boring ball kind of way. And you can imagine there wouldn't be much for us to study about in terms of chemistry at all. And of course, we wouldn't even be here because how can you produce something like that with just boring H chemistry? Okay, so I've been talking about atoms. Let's talk a little bit closer to the field with electrons. Electrons in a metal have wave properties too, and this Pauli exclusion principle actually is very important in describing how metals work. I'm studying in my devices something called a tunnel junction where you have electron waves that are uh, forming in this aluminum. And then what we do is we grow a very thin aluminum oxide layer by just putting in oxygen into the system, which naturally oxidizes surface and then depositing evaporating aluminum on top. And even though aluminum oxide is an insulator and the electrons shouldn't go through it, it turns out that if you make this thin enough, these electron waves can go through here and here, and these states, these this electrons can connect to these electrons. For example, in the particular devices we make using superconductors, you actually find current that flows through this junction even with zero voltage. So this is called a supercurrent. Current flows without resistance. And then if you look at higher voltages across here, you basically see no current until you get up to some superconducting gap. That has to do with actual, the actual way the superconducting uh, electrons bind together and tells you a lot about the physics of how the superconductors work. In modern transistors, these are approaching uh, atom sizes. Uh, here you have a wire here and wire here. Current flows through the silicon. There's a little capacitor here, kind of like this, where this voltage turns on and off that current. This is a very thin insulating barrier right here. And to describe this, again, you need quantum mechanics, physics of silicon. It turns out that in modern devices, it's very easy. This is so thin that electrons can tunnel from here to here, which is bad. That's a leakage current that consumes a lot of power, and you just can't make portable devices that way, like my laptop. So they suppress that by making this with special materials to make sure that they kill the quantum tunneling process through here. So it's very important in these modern devices to understand quantum mechanics. So I've been talking about atoms and metals. Quantum mechanics is there to describe fundamental particles and nuclei, molecules. Talked a little bit about superconductors. But what I want to talk about is quantum mechanics on the macroscopic realm. Now, I first want to talk about kind of a trivial, tri more trivial macroscopic realm. And uh, let me uh, kind of introduce this with the concept. I have a crystal of calcite here, here, and there's one in my hand. And I'm going to ask you why in Boulder, Colorado, where I used to live, and why in California do so many people think that crystals are magical? Okay? And if you put a razor blade on top of that, it won't, uh, it won't get dull. Or oh, that, that's pyramid, sorry. Okay, that's something else. But why do people think this is so magical, okay, and have things? The answer is, is that when you look at this crystal, you are seeing quantum mechanics that is now observable on the macroscopic scale. Okay, how does that work? This crystal here is made of individual atoms, and because of the way that they, they're bonding together, they're stacking in a regular manner. And when they stack up over you know, millions and billions and et cetera of atoms, they then follow kind of the planes in which they're stacking up so that on a macroscopic size, you can see these, these planes here. And in fact, by looking at this crystal and the way these planes are, 
you actually know how the atoms are, the individual atoms are put together, at least in, not maybe in complete detail, but you have a pretty good idea of how they're putting together. And all this means is that quantum mechanics is observable on the macroscopic scale in crystals and in terms in superconductors. You can have this zero current over long distances and uh, very important and use, these are useful technologies that that happens. What I want to talk about in the rest of the talk is a different physics, and that is can you actually build something like this where macroscopic variables obey quantum mechanics? Can this whole crystal on its own, by itself, obey quantum mechanics? And let me explain that in a little bit more detail here. So I have a crystal. All of the atoms in the crystal are bound by the uh, atomic forces to be constrained to be next to each other. And let's say you go to low temperature, there's not much vibration or whatever going on. If you want to describe the state of this crystal, I just say, well, what's its coordinate, say, at the center of mass? Maybe rotational uh, coordinates, too. And my question is, will this single macroscopic object obey quantum mechanics? And as an example here, I take this ball and I drop it on the table here and it bounces up. And you know that if I do this a bunch of times, it's going to keep bouncing. But what quantum mechanics says is because this obeys a little bit like a wave, that wave can penetrate through this, uh, through this uh, table and there's a small chance that the, it's, instead of bouncing, it's going to tunnel through the wall. Okay. And, and, you know, okay, so we can sit here for a long time. I'm going to run out of time. But it, you know it's not going to happen. And the reason is, is that this object is so big, okay, that its wave thing is so tiny, there's essentially zero chance for it to go through the wall, go through here. Now, what we've done, and, and in fact, Leggett uh, understood this, is there's a way to make an equivalent of such a device, of such a system, using electronic systems, okay? And in the superconductor, here's this complicated wave function, whatever, that there's a single variable here that describes the whole wave function of what all those electrons are doing in a similar manner that this center of mass coordinate is telling you what's going on here. And it turns out that means that the current is kind of like a single degree of freedom in this whole system, just like this is a single degree of freedom. And the single variable just sets the current. Okay, you, if you know what the current is, know what it turns out the phase is current, you know what's going on. That means if we build an integrated circuit like we do here, a quantum circuit, the currents and voltages are now described by quantum mechanics if you build the circuit properly. And we can put this together in a way so that the current flowing in this loop here is both turning this way and the other way at the very same time. Just like you can have an electron that's both here on this side of the nuclei and this side and all sides in the same way, you can do the same thing for currents, okay? And this is a, this is a macroscopic system. This is not made up of millions, billions of atoms. You can, you can describe it that way. Now, these are microwave circuits, about five gigahertz, more or less your cell phone frequencies to make sure that h bar omega, the energy of those photons, are, are bigger than kT. We have to go to very low temperatures, typically about 20 millikelvin in a dilution refrigerator. This is just something we can buy commercially. Uh, uh, this, is, this is not that uh, hard. And then we have a bunch of microwave generators that go in and equivalent to exciting the system with light, but now it's, it's microwave light at lower frequencies. And then we have to filter all this stuff to make sure the microwave noise at room temperature goes in. And then we put various control circuits on here. And then that changes the state of this quantum bit. And we measure it at the end, whether we got a zero or one. And we can kind of understand what's going on to the system. I'm not going to go into too much detail there, but that's the basic idea. So this is going back to my thesis. We have this little Josephson junction. This is about a centimeter across. At this little cross here is connected up here to a bunch of filters. This particular electrical circuit, there's a nonlinear inductance from this Josephson junction that forms a potential like this. 
And what we're going to do, we did in this experiment was to look to see for quantum mechanical behavior at high temperature, this is just an escape over a potential barrier, classic physics chemistry problem. At high temperature, we'll see escape rate due to this, that we know what's going on. If you go to low enough temperatures, this will quantum tunnel out this way. So just briefly describing what's going on there, this is a, a description of that tunneling rate through here, described as an effective temperature. This is the real temperature of the system. At high temperature, we see this thermal escape. And then at low temperature, this levels off to a value very close to what we expect theoretically due to this quantum tunneling. We can do fancier experiments. Remember, we see these discrete photon energies when we look at atoms. We can see the same thing in this. We shine on microwaves on this. And with the microwaves, we can induce transitions between the various energy levels in this system. And these transitions give us an enhancement of the escape rate when the microwave frequency is on resonant with the transition. And this bump here, and this bump here, and this bump here corresponds to these different transitions. And we can tell what's going on here. So that was back in the 80s. Um, we've gotten much more sophisticated experiments now. We can make these in different ways. We have a charge flux phase qubits. Here are some pictures. We kind of think of these as different atoms that we know how to make, putting together the various elements of this electrical circuit in different ways. We can connect those with resonators, which are like piano wire resonators, to exchange information from our qubits to the resonator. Various kind of quantum limited amplifiers. We can also put several of these together and have them interact in a way that's reminiscent of how molecules work. And we can look at all the physics of how these things interact uh, in the way that you might look at how molecules interact. Our latest version here, we call it the Xmon Transmon. Our little superconducting quantum bit is down here. There's a, a cross of metal. This is mostly metal here, and we're as black as where the aluminum has been etched away. This little cross at the bottom has these Josephson junctions, and you have current flowing from here to here uh, in this quantum mechanical way. And then we can connect one transmon to the other with this resonator right here. We have another resonator here that connects this to a readout line so we can measure the state of it. Mostly what I'm trying to show here is that we can put this together and engineer these quantum systems in kind of an arbitrary way to do whatever function we want to do. And that's the hope is that we can kind of uh, be a little bit more creative in the way we make atoms uh, as opposed to chemistry where you have fixed, fixed rules. Maybe not as rich, but we certainly put it together in different ways. I want to now talk in the last five minutes an experiment we did uh, with the emulation of spins with a quantum circuit. And you recall when I was talking about the spin statistics theorem, I said that when you rotated a spin electron by 2 pi, you got a minus sign. Okay? And I want to explain the experiment we did to kind of understand that. And that's, you have to take more advanced quantum mechanics to understand that. But I kind of want to show you that in this emulation kind of way, you can, make, you can see that there's actually a minus sign there. So what we're going to do is we're going to build this quantum circuit hardware to emulate these higher spin numbers. And we're going to demonstrate with a, a kind of looks like spin rotation. We're going to kind of look at this uh, spin parity. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to note that the spin 1 half fermion for electron actually has two spin states. Okay? And we're going to encode that spin states in either a 0 or 1. Or it's for a trick I'll explain later. We can also encode that in terms of this state 1 and 2. So there's a bunch of energy levels in this potential diagram I was talking about. Uh, mostly I'm going to talk about this. But if we want to spin, uh, emulate a spin 1, which is a boson plus 1, then we would have to do with three states, say, with the 1, 2, 3. Okay? So uh, this is how we're going to do it. We're just going to take pairs of states. We're going to do some rotation and see what the sign is of the parity after the rotation. And given that all these transition frequencies are different, we can put microwaves in at different frequencies 
and to tune up to all those transitions and control everything in a nice way. Okay, I'm going to explain part of this. Uh, what we're going to do, I want to explain this diagram here. Okay, and what we're going to do first is we're going to put on a microwave pulse and we're going to go do a transition from the ground state to the first excited state. So you just let the system just relax to the ground state. We then put on the microwave pulse and we know we're in the one state. Then what we're going to do is we're going to, on the one state, we're going to apply a microwave signal that's resonant for one to two just for a variable amount of time here, okay? And we're just going to keep it on. And after a certain amount of time, we're going to measure the system and say, is it, are we in one or two? So when time equals zero here, and you look here, you're more or less all in one and very little in two. And then as you turn on this pulse, you see the one state start going down and the two states start going up because you're doing a transition. And if you keep going with this, the two state goes down and the one state goes back up again. And what we're interested in this experiment is what's going on right here, okay? This state here is in the one state, but according to this spin statistics theorem kind of idea, this is not the one state, this is the minus one state. Minus times the one state. Now when you take the probability, you square that, and minus squared is one, you can't tell you know, if there's a minus state there, okay? So what we're going to do next is show you how to do that to tell for that minus state. And the way you do for that minus state is we use a phase reference, which is the zero state. That's why I did the rotation from the one and zero. So sorry, this is a little bit technical, but I'll try to explain the basic ideas. Instead of doing a pi pulse that takes you from zero to one, we do half the duration of that pulse, and that puts us in a superposition of both zero and one at the same time. Then we do those Robbie rotations, and that's a two pi rotation. If you got a one, one state, it's zero plus one. If there was a minus state here, it's zero minus one. I then put on the same microwave pulse here, and if it was this state, it'll go to a one. If it's this state here, it'll go to zero. So I can tell whether the state here by looking at the final state. So here's a spin zero where you don't do anything with one, that's fine. For spin a half, what we see here is if I have no rotation, it looks like this. If I do this pi pi and I get a rotation, a minus one, this is now shifted by 180 degrees. And that corresponds to the minus sign for that mysterious minus sign of that one state. So you can directly see that in an emulate. This is known in quantum mechanics for a long time, but we can emulate that. And it turns out if you do S to equal one, which is three states, you get no shift. And you do uh, four states, which is S equal three halves, you get the minus one phase factor again. So you basically show here in kind of this uh, spin statistics that with an integer uh, uh, values, you get plus one and half integers, you get the minus one. Hopefully um, uh, an, an understanding of what's going on there. So we, with these kind of uh, things, we've tried to build more and more complicated circuits. This is kind of the most complicated circuit we've made. It's a nine mode quantum processor. We have quantum bit states here and here. They're connected to lambda over four resonators here, kind of acting as memory. And then these can all talk to each other via this bus here. And with this experiment, we've done a very simple quantum computation experiment where we factored the number 15, okay? And we did get five times three, if you're wondering. <laughs> but okay, it's, it's got somewhat complicated. We can make these macroscopic quantum systems out of electrical systems. People now are working on making it out of mechanical systems too. The particular case we were looking at here uh, was a uh, a piezoelectric transducer. This is essentially like a quartz uh, transducer that you might see in your cell phone or computer or watch that sets the time of the system. In this particular case, we have a slab of metal, slab of, of material that oscillates back and forth like this. And because it's a uh, uh, piezoelectric material, that produces a uh, current oscillation 
uh, that goes out here and then goes to our qubits, we can we detect. So we use our superconducting qubits as an extremely sensitive detector on these mechanical oscillators. And for this kind of chip, we were able to show the, we have quantum mechanical oscillations here. Other people have, um, have built similar systems we're using light readout, again, uh, being able to show quantum mechanical behavior. So there's a big revolution going on now to look at these, uh, these systems. So that, that's the end of my talk. Um, a lot of this work is, is only, all this work is only possible with a large number of people helping with this. Here, here we are, a, a photo a few years ago on a beautiful uh, beach out here uh, at UC Santa Barbara. Here's more people are involved uh, more, uh, more recently. And again, uh, this is not possible, all this work is not possible with a, a, without a lot of very hard work from dedicated people. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, thanks for a beautiful talk, and we have plenty of times for questions. Any questions from the audience? The back. Well, uh, this is, I, I, I sort of know two thirds of the answer to my question, but if you go back to your toilet paper analogy, you know, and say you connect that to make it a Mobius strip, you know, and if you, if with the t half twist in your paper, that you were talking about. Uh, oh, you know, yeah, the yeah. Yeah, the toilet okay, paper. Yes. Yeah. yes, you're talking about the spin statistics. Yeah, there. the spin statistics. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's now, fine. if you go back and with that strip, with a half twist, if you connect it, then if you go 360 degrees, uh, you know, uh, what would be pointing up would be pointing down. And if you go around it twice, then you've got your original direction. Now, with regard to um, using that sort of concept, is there, do you think there's any substance to actually with your Pauli exclusion principle, the spin statistics, when you um, are building up atomic structure, is there any actual possible change in the actual space itself that would have a half twist that might incorporate that? Sort of a metaphysical question. Yeah, um, I, I don't really have an answer to that. Um, um, the, the, looking deep into the spin statistics theorem is kind of a deep uh, theoretical question that I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in. Uh, so yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe we can talk about this later. Well, uh, I, 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 it'll be hard for me to answer that. Sort of a question. But <laughs> yeah. Okay, further questions? Yes. Yeah, so what is the, the oh, just wait for the microphone. <laughs> so you did three times five, 15. What are some of the technical difficulties that you have to overcome to do some more challenging problems? Yeah, OK. Um, when you do quantum mechanics on an, on an atom in vacuum, it's really in a perfect environment. So although there are some physical requirements of radiation, light, whatever, um, it, it, it really obeys some very well understood laws. When we make a, you know, a physical circuit, and here's actually a circuit that people want to look at, the chip is in the, the center, these are really big qubits. And that means your, your quantum state is connected to a whole lot of defects, okay? And this is the real challenge of what we're doing is you know, engineering the system to minimize those defects and to get rid of it. And I think one of the most amazing things is that nature actually gives us pretty simple materials where the defect density is really low enough to do interesting things. And I would just say that's a gift from nature. These particular Joseph's injunctions are made in a very simple way, and it turns out that they're essentially you know, perfect, defect-free, because they're small. We make our substrates out of sapphire, the metal is aluminum, done in a little bit careful way, but again, nature gives us something that works well. So I, I treat it as a gift from nature that if we engineer uh, that well, it can work. However, said that, I've probably put about 50 people in my lab over 10 years slowly working on that problem. And uh, besides being a gift, it's been a lot of hard work 
just to figure out all that's going on. But it seems to work great. But you wouldn't, you know, from the beginning, why, why would you think that it would work? Further questions? Oh, yeah. Um, on one of your slides, I think it was the emulation of spins with a quantum circuit, and there was a transition from the one state to the two state. Right. I don't know. I couldn't, you know, maybe my vision's getting bad, but is it exact um, 100% like is the top of the y-axis across the board a constant, or is there any loss yeah, um, from one state um, to the next? Let me, let me um, uh, talk to that. Oops, one slide. Yeah, yeah when we do these uh, transitions, um, uh, you see the, uh, we do this transition here. The one state is not exactly at 100%. Is that kind of your question? Yeah, and when it shifts, when you, when you say the one state is dropping as the two state is rising, is there any loss at all? Is it ever, like, if yeah, you, you can, add the one and the two, is there not 100%? You can see that this is getting lost over time. Right. Okay. And that is these material defects that I've been talking about. Uh, interaction with these other microscopic defects, we lose some of the state versus time, and you can kind of see it going on here. So that's, that's kind of the loss that that's a big problem. What's happened is this data was kind of a few years old. Kind of, we could do operations here in 10, 20 nanoseconds. We, the, the memory would be like three or 400 nanoseconds. We now can make uh, the memory 100 times better to 30 microseconds. So that lo loss is very tiny. And because that ratio is so good, we think we can store and manipulate quantum information and do a lot more neat experiments with it. Another question? I just want to kind of add to what she was saying. I think I had the same observation. In the third, what, uh, I guess it's the third node? Yeah, over, over up, yeah. For, for, I mean, I'm a biologist, so this is all new. Okay. Uh, top graph. Yeah. The pointed over to the right, to the right, no. To the right, yeah, that right there. That, yeah, as that's increased. Oh, three it, is going up a little exactly. bit. Exactly. So I mean, I'm looking at it as simplistic as conservation of energy. So like, is that, is that the loss that you're talking about? Well, so you're talking about this little brown thing here. Yeah, exactly. Ah, you're very observant. That's great. What happens is, is when we put on microwaves one to two, um, we have to do that in a finite time. And that means there's some spread in the frequency. And that spread in the frequency means that there's a little bit of transition from two to three. We try to minimize that, but, but we are making small amounts of two to three because uh, you know, it's not a, a perfectly CW source. And that means as we go up to two, we're also going up to three at the same time. So um, that's actually one of the things we have to worry about. Uh, how to control that so we don't see these defects. And in fact, the KITP conference that we've been at the last week, one of the issues has been, well, how do you generate pulses so that this doesn't happen? And there's a lot of theoretical techniques that people are doing to get rid of those kind of, of things. You can shape your microwave pulses in some fancy way to get rid of that which has kind of been a, a, a pleasant surprise to see that there's so many clever ways to get rid of those kind of things. It's just more knobs you have to kind of turn to get it to work. But it's kind of cool. There is a question over here. Okay, this will be the last question. I'm just curious to know what kind of materials do you use to make those circuits? Is it silicon or what yeah, kind? Yeah, so the basic substrate is sapphire, but we think we could also use a silicon wafer. The key to that is to use a crystalline material because there are very, very few defects in the crystalline material. When we have those defects, that can soak up some of the microwave energy and give us problems. The basic superconductor itself is aluminum. Uh, it's a superconductor at about one Kelvin. And since we're operating at 20 millikelvin, that's like a high temperature superconductor for us. 
And aluminum has very nice properties that gives it very low loss. It's kind of magic, and we can make these tunnel junctions. It's, again, aluminum is kind of a gift of nature to us. Thank and you. then those are more or less the main materials. Uh, we're starting to incorporate other things, but that's the basis of everything we do. Uh, but we're doing, we have a big program to try to look at other materials and figure out if there are better ways to do it. But it's hard to beat those two. Thank you again.